<laughs> okay, um, yeah, now the mic is yours. So, uh, reading from Bhagavad Gita, uh, chapter three. Um, chapter 3, text number 43, so very nice to write at the final verse of the third chapter. And to dive on the truth, the third chapter is probably my favorite chapter in Obama Gita. Uh, it's such a, uh, something I always return to again and again, because it deals with uh, the practicalities of someone trying to perform your duty in the material world and still coming out Krishna conscious at the other side. So really such a nice chapter to, for meditation. And this last verse... Uh, really then the culmination of um, what Krishna has now taught Arjuna. So a uh, very nice verse. So we'll, how do I just chant it and then read because it's a little awkward to chant together. So I'll just uh, maybe first chant our invocations to Vasudev before we start. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Evang bodhe parang bodhva sang stapyatva namatmana jahi shatrum mahabaho kamarupam durasadam. So, thus knowing oneself to be transcendental to the material senses, mind, and intelligence, Almighty Armed Arjuna, one should steady the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence, Krishna consciousness, and thus by spiritual strength. Conquer this insatiable enemy known as lust. Purport. This third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is conclusively directive to Krishna consciousness by knowing oneself as the eternal servitor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead without considering impersonal voidness the ultimate end. In the material existence of life, one is certainly influenced by propensities for lust and desire for dominating the resources of material nature. Desire for overlording and for sense gratification is the greatest enemy of the conditioned soul. But by the strength of Krishna consciousness, one can control the material senses, the mind, and the intelligence. One may not give up work and prescribe duties all of a sudden, but by gradually developing Krishna consciousness, one can be situated in a transcendental position without being influenced by the material senses and the mind, by steady intelligence directed toward one's pure identity. This is the sum total of this chapter. In the immature stage of material existence, philosophical speculations and artificial attempts to control the senses by the so-called practice of yogic postures can never help a man towards spiritual life. He must be trained in Krishna consciousness by higher intelligence. And thus end the Bhaktivedanta purpose of the third chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita in the matter of karma yoga or the discharge of one's prescribed duty in Krishna consciousness. Om Jnana Timinandasya Jnana Vrubhaya Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manovishtam Stabitam Minavutale Svayam Rupa Gadamayam Tadati Svabhadantikam So always nice to get the last verse of the chapter because then you basically can speak about everything that has come before. So uh, it's a nice uh, privilege. And uh, we see here then actually um, this is a concluding verse. So always important when we read the Bhagavad Gita to remember that it is a, a conversation. So, like with all conversations, it's difficult if you just fall into a conversation at the end. It's difficult to understand what has happened. You know, you have to follow the whole conversation, the whole dialogue. So when we look at the Bhagavad Gita, then we can sometimes focus on individual verses and that are powerful. And then we can look at them and memorize them because they have some important points. But then also we can look, it's also important sometimes to look at the, at the flow of the whole conversation, because that also helps us to understand the specific points that have been made. Um, and uh, in that way, we see how everything is connected together, which is then something that really comes out if we study uh, the commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita. Now here, we see that Krishna has, uh, this conclusion is basically an answer to Arjuna's question that he asked here in verse, 
36. Mm. Uh, probably one of the most, let's say, the most important questions that a human being can ask. Many important questions one can ask. And the first most important question is, who am I? Uh, that when you get this certain points in your life, you get the shocking experience and you're not sure who you are or what you're supposed to do. Uh, and it happens again and again. It happens when you hit puberty, and then you become a teenager, and then even in midlife, you can again <clears throat> you have a midlife crisis where you ask yourself, who am I uh, and what am I supposed to do? So in this way, a very important question that we ask again and again. But uh, then here also Arjuna asks another very important question, this 40, in verse 36. Um, and this is the question about how is it and why is it that we do things that we know is not good for us? Hmm? This really is just such a, a peculiar part of being a human being that regularly we... Um, we somehow, even though we know it's not, it's not a good idea, we know that the results will not be good, but still we are somehow forced to do something that um, is not going to make us happy and will also sometimes cause unhappiness to others. So that is this question in the 36th verse. By what is it that one is impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force. Um, so why did Arjuna ask this question? Because the, the whole topic that was discussed in this third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita was the topic of duty. Uh, and any cultured human being understands that uh, we have duties to perform. Uh, so many duties we have. Duties to our family, duties to our society, duties to our community. And ultimately, we understand that all these duties are part of Krishna's system. Uh, Krishna created family life. He created societal responsibilities, created so many responsibilities that help us to direct our life, uh, direct our desires. And in the third chapter, basically, Krishna explains to Arjuna that by performing your duty, the best result will come. Mm -hmm. If you can clearly understand what is your duty, then if you perform these duties, then these duties will elevate you. And these duties will help purify your heart and they will also bring uh, the best result for society. They will make it possible society runs smoothly. And we see that all the problems we have in society is because people are not properly performing their duty. Hmm? We see now, for example, uh, here in America, there are so many riots, massive riots because of police brutality. So meaning certain members who have now the responsibility to protect people, they misuse their power uh, to harm people, and then it causes great social disruption, great chaos. But so many, even in individual re relationships, we see that you get married, and then there is infidelity. So you cheat on your you cheat on your spouse. You're not performing your duties to your spouse, and so much heartbreak comes, so much trouble, so much suffering for the children, for yourself. The relationship is broken. Your life then it gets so complicated. So we see that all over the place, when we, whenever we um, disrupt our duties and not properly performing our duties, our responsibilities, then life becomes much more complicated. And then also becomes very difficult to think about Krishna. Because whenever we have this disruption in our life due to not performing our duties, then um, the mind becomes disturbed by the reactions that come. And then it is difficult to focus the attention on Krishna. So Arjuna hears all this, and he hears Krishna's teachings, and he says, yes, this makes sense. I can understand this. I can see that it is better if I perform my duty. But then the next obvious question is, why, why don't we do it? Why is it so difficult to do the right thing? And then he asks this question. What is it that impels us to perform sinful acts? What is it that impels us uh, to break our promises? to not perform our, our responsibilities, to abandon our vows? Uh, what is it that forces us to harm other people, even though we don't want to? And um, whenever we do it, even afterwards, you might feel great shame and regret, which most people actually do. Most people that harm us or harm other people, at a certain point later in their life, they actually feel bad about it. Uh, even sometimes people you think are, are rotten to the core, even those people, I promise you, 
Um, it is there's only a handful of sociopaths in the world who feel no remorse, but most average people they feel bad and guilty when they're honest with themselves about what they have done to other people. Mm. But why do we do it? And then Krishna says, yes, there's only one reason. Mm. It is lust, it is karma. Karma Esha, Kroda Esha, Raja Guna Samutuva. It is due to lust that is generated from the mode of passion and that then turns into anger. That is the reason why uh, people within this world um, do things that are not good for themselves and good for others. And it is a very powerful force. Krishna explains it is Mahashana. It is all devouring. Why is it all devouring? Because there's one problem with lust. And what is lust? Lust means desire that is uh, devoid of intelligence. So desire is not a bad thing. We all have so many desires that we want, so many things that we want within this world, and desire is not a problem. But it is the moment that desire uh, becomes devoid of any intelligence, the moment that desire becomes disconnected from understanding the bigger picture, from understanding who we really are and what is really good for us, that force of desire um, that is coming from the moment when we become uh, entangled in the mode of passion, that is lust, that is karma. And that force is Mahashano, because um, just like a fire, even if you feed it, however much you put on that fire, you can never uh, extinguish the fire by feeding it. It will just burn higher. So that's also, lust is like that. The, if you look at someone who is addicted to drugs, taking drugs will not uh, make the desire go away. That is the problem. So even you have a strong desire for something, you, d you can take as much of that thing as you want. The next day you will want it again. So that's the problem with, with that kind of desire, with karma. Then also, it is Mahapapma. It is greatly sinful because somehow it is such a powerful force that um, when we become influenced by it, we can do the most crazy things. I recently saw this video, somehow in front of this video of a man in uh, Hyderabad in, um, in South India. And uh, the, someone had, he found out that his wife was cheating on him with this other guy who was a rickshaw wala. So he was a rickshaw driver. who Somehow was cheating on his wife with this other guy or with, on this other guy's wife. And then this man, he found out who it was and then he drove to this busy intersection where all the rickshaw wallers are stationed. So it's right in the middle. You know, it's like right in the middle of a very public place, thousands of people milling about and all the rickshaw guys are standing there waiting for their drivers. And then this guy, he goes there with an ax and then he just kills that other man right there in the middle of the street, in front of everyone. He just walks over to him. He says, what are you doing with my wife? There's a big scuffle and he kills him with an ax right there. So astounding that you can do something like that, isn't it? So completely blinded by anger, blinded by the rage that can come when, there's, when we become entangled with karma, strong desire. So such a force, um, desire and anger, it can completely overwhelm us and push us to do uh, the most uh, intense things. And we see it all, all, all around the world. So Krishna then says, we have to understand that this thing is our greatest enemy this power of this desire when it is strongly directed this is the thing that causes us to um, make our lives more complicated than it needs to be isn't it life is already so complicated but somehow we can make it even more complicated i have one good friend whenever you ask him what are you doing or how is it going he always has the same answer because he's figured out that that's really what a large part of life is about and he says that i'm just trying to stay out of trouble <laughs> that's like and we see that it's difficult to stay out of trouble in the material world. Trouble somehow finds us, even though if we don't want it. Um, because of uh, this force of desire that can immediately spring upon us when we least expect it. So then Krishna explains how, yes, this desire covers us, covers the intelligence. And uh, it is sitting in the various parts of our psyche, sitting within our senses. So our actual senses crave certain experiences. Like for example, if you become a... Uh, we, a lot of studies have been done about addiction. So we know now that addiction is actually also something physical. So when Krishna says here in verse 40, he says that lust, it sits within the senses, it sits within their mind, and it sits within the intelligence. It means that um, we become conditioned by desire, even just physically. If you take certain drugs, for example, for a long time, 
your your actual body starts to crave it you you can even if you you can see if people have if you have a heroin addict and he stops taking heroin then his actual body shows symptoms it's not just a psychological thing it's not just something that's in the mind his body will start to show show certain symptoms of withdrawal his temperature will drop he can have intense fever he can have intense symptoms of disease as his body is trying to get rid now of this craving so it means that this karma it actually sits within the body it sits within the senses itself it, it becomes physical it also sits within the mind so our actual emotions and our um, also our imagination you see that strong desire it also influences the images that we see we all know that that's how desire works we have our our fantasies that we build up for ourselves so all these images that we see within the psyche that are projected to us uh, or that we project to ourselves coming at us and whenever we we all have we all are, are uh, practicing meditators so we know that's what happens so when you try and chant your rounds the difficulty is you try to hear the maha mantra but then you also you also see what's happening on the Your mind is like a big television, and it's showing us all this in the mind. But uh, unfortunately, these images are not always about Gordon or about Iskan Gordon, about the wonderful deities. Um, the images are sometimes other kinds of images, um, images of desire, whatever is our, our desires that we have that are projected onto the screen. Mind. Um, so that's what infiltrates into the intelligence. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means that um, what happens is, is that we start to rationalize and give good reasons for why it is that we should do certain things. Mm -hmm. So the amazing thing with um, the power of the illusory energy is that um, all, everything we do, we think that um, it comes from ourself. We think we have we want to do it because we have made the decision and we have good reasons for it. So the power of rationalization. So, but in actual fact, it's not like that. There's a conditioning that pushes us. And then we convince ourselves. And in this way, you can also hear that sound within your mind when you start to build up good reasons for why exactly it is that you're going to do this. So in that way, also the karma, it sits within the intelligence and it, um, even our very thought process and our logic and rationale is pushed towards doing uh, that very thing that will not help us become happy so what a uncomfortable decision to say the least um but then krishna says so in the beginning because this karma is so all pervasive so we encounter it in so many different parts of ourself and when asked in the very beginning start by regulating the senses starting the process at least at the beginning to start to create some regulation in our life um, however much we can and then slowly build up from there because um, the first step in conquering our minds or our internal world is starting with the external world so therefore we know for example all of us we are many of us we take our vows to um, live according to principles of purity but you can, you can vow to stop the behavior, but the desire might still be there. What can we do? You know, like uh, many things that we, we still like, some addictions can we, we say, okay, now at least I won't do it externally. I will, I will at least, my behavior, I will, I will make borders and say, no, no more, no more of this, no more of that. But the desire might still be there, but that's okay. Krishna says, that's fine. The first step is to start with the senses. You know? Yam Yandao. So we start with regulating the, the senses. Because by first regulating the senses, then slowly but surely we will also start to regulate the mind and regulate the intelligence. And then he explains how we have to understand that there's above the senses is the mind, above the mind is the intelligence, and above the intelligence is the soul. And then Krishna ends with this verse 43, saying that we have to understand that ultimately. Um, the reason, our real hope, and this is an important point. So when we get into the dynamics of our conditioning, it can become a little bit 
um, bleak. <laughs> it become a little bit oof. Like a, when you hear this, there's like you start to sweat a little bit, and you're like, oh my god, this is sounds hectic, you know. It's such a uh, it's such an all pervasive issue. How will I ever overcome this conditioning? But then Krishna, it's, it's a message of hope that he speaks right at the end. Very important that we have hope, because without hope, things are really hopeless. So the devotee always has hope, and this uh, hope is is really at the core of our spiritual life. And this hope is not um, irrational. Sometimes nowadays in the modern world at least if pure human being can become perfect ideals Oops. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Actually, okay. um, I don't know why, but maybe it's better. Sometimes we, we cannot hear you properly. And okay. because I guess this connection is not so good. And okay. maybe it's better uh, if, we, if you switch off the, the, uh, the video. Okay, cool. This video sucks in any case. Good. Interesting enough, yeah, we're in America, but the internet is horrible. Can you believe that? The land of the free, <laughs> everything is supposed to be great, and it's not so great. Internet in New York, yeah? Huh? In New York City, can you believe that? Yeah? Come on. That's the capital of the world. Okay, so... So, uh, okay. maybe maybe let, let me just tell you where, where we didn't, didn't hear you anymore. Okay. And um, where was it? <laughs> Somebody remember? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Where, where there's a uh, reason to hope. Mm. And oh, hope. No. And then you were okay. starting to explain something, and we were all very curious, yeah. but I forgot what it was. Okay, hope. Yes. So we said that when we look at this reality of our conditioning, we become a little hopeless. But uh, it is important to keep some hope. Maybe you can keep your keep your uh, account unmuted, Janitai, because then it's easier for me to realize. Because I don't know when I'm I knock out. Because you all sit so quiet and attentive, it okay. looks like you're all listening. But it is sound, and I can know. So, um, uh, hope, yes, hope. So we're saying how very important to have hope. Uh, the, 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 the devotee, he does two things. The devotee, he looks the reality squarely in the eyes. So that's the first step. We become very honest, and we just look at what is what is what is really the case, and that requires a little bit of courage. Um, but the moment that you do that, then you also uh, develop. You have to have hope to see that it is possible to, um, to move forward in life and to become pure, to become perfect. And we're saying how in the modern world, many people have completely abandoned this idea that it is possible to perfect oneself, to perfect one's life, or to become a, a pure soul, a pure devotee, whatever, to become some, uh, some ideal of perfection. And many times, if you would tell, tell someone out on the street that, Someone asks you, what is it that you are, what is your goal in your life? What is it that you plan to do? And you say, no, I plan to become pure. Then people will laugh or they'll say that that's ridiculous because many people have uh, completely abandoned hope that it is possible for a human being um, to become uh, pure or to become in one sense saintly. But uh, that, is, that is not the case. Um, it is definitely possible, uh, definitely possible. And um, even if we have to be honest with ourselves, even though we might not be there yet, we have all come quite a long way. To the, come to the point of even just sitting there in that temple and being interested in hearing about spiritual philosophy, that already is something quite extraordinary. It means that all of us here, at least, we are uh, honest enough to sit here and be willing to listen to it. And that is the start of the, it's like the igniting the little fire 
that makes it possible for this um, process to purify. So a lot of hope. And then in this last verse, therefore Krishna explains what is the, the core of our hope? What is our hope based on? And our hope is based on the understanding that we have to really see that we are transcendental. Even though we are at the moment conditioned to a large part, and sometimes our conditioning gets the better of us, um, we are at the same time still um, spirit soul, meaning that we have our free will. And uh, we have the ability uh, on a regular basis, every day we have a new opportunity to make good decisions, a new opportunity to take certain steps in the right direction. Every single day, it's very nice how Krishna set it up that we have this cycle of going to sleep, dealing with reality, and the next day you wake up, it's like you start afresh again, you can try again. And we've seen it also when sometimes if we're very angry, for example, if something bad happens and you have a horrible day and then you go to sleep and the next day you wake up, things usually are a little lighter. There's some new, you know, you sort of, a little more distant and just by time you again get another opportunity so every day we have this opportunity to somehow make these good decisions to slowly but surely with individual victories become closer um, to um, krishna's desire and um, therefore he says one has to know oneself to be transcendental one has to understand that one is always free and one always has the opportunity to um, slowly but surely improve himself and move forward in the right direction and you do that by um, taking shelter, taking shelter of um, this spiritual knowledge, by steadying the self, steadying the mind by the intelligence. And slowly one can come to the point of conquering um, this lust. And then we see that there's obviously then the whole process of Krishna consciousness. As Prabhupada says here, firstly, it is a gradual process. It is a gradual process by which we slowly mold our life and that Krishna gives us directions for wherever it is that we are, wherever we find ourselves within our life. If we're young, if we're older, if we're married or not married, or if we're having a work, or if we're living in the temple, it really doesn't matter at which part of your life phase you're finding yourself. At each of these phases, it is possible to take shelter of, um, of spiritual knowledge. And then also slowly making the important first step is to understand um, to gain some clarity about our duties, our responsibilities, our prescribed duties, because these duties they actually help us quite a bit. So more and more to understand. If you see, if you ever go for relationship counseling, which most people have to do nowadays, you ever find yourself in a relationship and so many difficulties that come, then you will see a large part of the counseling, a large part of the, the process is that both parties have to slowly but surely understand what exactly it is they have to do to make the other person happy. That's like the big thing. And it's a big part of the process. And if you ever live within a brahmachari ashram, you live within an ashram, you see it's actually exactly the same thing. You know, if you want to be happy there, you have to learn more and more what you have to do to make the people you are living with happy. And the more clarity you gain about the various responsibilities that you have and things you have to adjust and do in order to make those happy who are closest to you, um, that is actually our duties. So duties, is, it's not this horrible word or something very difficult. No, it's like just taking, understanding how we have to invest our energy and adjust ourselves in order to improve the lives of others around us and make sure we fulfill our responsibilities toward them. So this is all part of actually this third chapter, you know, making, making it practical also, making it practical, seeing that I will be able to overcome um, my selfish conditioning by slowly becoming selfless and we all can do it every day on a small basis so many things we can do even whatever <laughs> like in the ashram so many things like you know, lifting up the toilet seat after you use it that already it's amazing you've done it you've, that decision is already a step in the right direction Stra starting to overcome your selfishness or when you cook, when you're in the kitchen cooking to understand that you have to clean up after yourself that already, by doing that, it means that you are moving in the direction of understanding that it's not just about myself. So it's a small example. So by slowly increasing and expanding our understanding of how the many ways in which we can um, stop being selfish and making that a point in our life, slowly but surely then we start to actually overcome the core of the problem, 
which is um, the fact that we are selfishly directed. So, and uh, therefore Krishna says, one has to always just see each decision, each decision we make each day as an opportunity to make the right decisions and to cultivate the qualities that are there within the soul. And in this way, our happiness can increase uh, very quickly and we also become a source of inspiration for others. And uh, we all will do it in our own unique way because we all have our own unique talents and our own life path. But the basic principle is all the same, which is slowly but surely connecting the intelligence with Krishna's desire and uh, making it practical, somehow seeing that all the decisions we make within this life has the potential to either bring happiness or it has the potential to bring more complication and uh, never missing an opportunity, even for the smallest things, to help uh, push us up. As Prabhupada says, mm, specific work, by steady intelligence directed towards one's pure identity. So to more and more embody the principle of being a servant as much as possible in the various avenues of our life. That is how one will be always moving in the right direction. Okay, so that was a, a few thoughts. Um, the class is a little bit off to a pumpy road. I'm actually still sitting here in my plumbing clothes. So it may be a good thing that my camera isn't working. Probably have all kinds of suit on my face and my hands are all dirty. So not exactly. A, that's the nice thing with these Zoom classes is that, you know, you don't even have to put on a dhoti. You can, <laughs> no, because no one sees. You can sit in your t-shirt. So uh, at least this class was fortunate if i had to run onto the vyasa sun from the from the from the boiler room it would have been a little more time consuming so i apologize for things starting off a little bumpy but uh, it is nice to it also makes sense because the bhagavad gita was written for that uh, the bhagavad gita wasn't written necessarily for a calm life and everything is perfect the bhagavad gita is written for the brutal realities of daily existence of dealing with life when it comes at us so therefore, perhaps it is fitting huh, that we speak the Bhagavad Gita. For me, it's in the middle of the day, right in the thick of things. And um, if we can't meditate on the Bhagavad Gita at this point, then we're missing it. Yeah? The Bhagavad Gita is meant to be um, thought upon and reflected right um, when things are getting very real. When you're knee deep in the sewage, then you can still think about Krishna's instructions to Arjuna. So here, maybe if anyone has... If you have a question or if you have a comment or if you just have a uh, you can share with us maybe something that you that you heard that you liked any kind of realization you'd like to share with the rest of us we greatly appreciate it yeah we have one question here in the temple sure. I mean, <laughs> we also have a question from norway after that okay first yeah, yeah, maybe first. Uh, thank you very, very much for your nice lecture. I um, was so encouraging and um, giving hope. And my uh, um, issue is hope. I have had some hopes about my Krishna consciousness, and I <laughs> feel that, um, that many times that I got fr frustrated with those hopes. And I wanted to know what you are practically, practically doing when you're frustrated with some hopes. Just ah. so what are you personally doing that refreshes your hope about something mm -hmm. you know Krishna consciousness? Wow, that's a great question. Because <laughs> to tell the truth, this temple Jainita has been here, so you know it's just this, the, the temple we are in is a temple that has basically almost closed down. They were on the brink of selling it. It is a whole uh a whole drama, uh, a, a fragmented community. Um, you know, when we came in here, it was uh, so many cockroaches and all kinds of amazing features to life here. <laughs> I have to tell you the truth, many times I felt very hopeless. I felt many times very hopeless because I personally, and my, my spiritual master actually cheated me because I was just supposed to come for two months. And that was... <laughs> That was about a year and four months ago. So uh, I've been tricked this, to be stuck here. So what can we say? So I've, I have to tell you, I have, to, I have thought a lot about hope and how to overcome hopelessness in the last year or so, because the place that I come from is actually very nice. I think I've been there also. 
<laughs> so I just come from this very nice place, almost like Freiburg, you know, like this very <laughs> nice little town and there was a mountain and all these things. And now I'm here and I don't even have proper internet, my God. <laughs> so, uh, hopelessness. The first thing I found sometimes is that uh, when we get overwhelmed, we generally become hopeless because we are overwhelmed. Uh, so when we become overwhelmed by a variety of things, it becomes too much. And then we just, we want to have this desire to run away or do something radical. Um, then what I do is I generally, I realize that it's very important in the last year, I realized it's very important to take a break sometimes. But even we understand that everything we do is in the three modes of nature. So whatever you do, it's either in the mode of passion, goodness, or ignorance. So when you take a break, you also have to understand that there's different ways in which you do it. When you sometimes just have to relax and sort of just disconnect a little bit from everything you're doing, there's three ways in which you can do it. And I think a large part of being able to maintain hope consistently is in being intelligent in how you um, sort of, what you do when you just have to get away a little bit. Because the one thing you can do, for example, when you just want to run away, is you can go onto your computer and you can just go onto YouTube and watch all kinds of stupid stuff just to distract your mind from what's <laughs> happening. That's what we do. But the problem when you do that, for example, is after you've had your, your one hour or two hour YouTube binge to forget about your life, when you come back, you don't feel, uh, you, you actually don't feel recharged. You know, you feel just more, more dilapidated because so much energy has now been dissipated into doing that. So what I prefer generally, I've seen now, is very important to just, sometimes I, I just have to get away and then I go, there's some very nice parks here. So I would go walk for a long time, go sit in the park, go completely get away from technology because I've seen now that um, taking shelter of technology for our recreation just uh, makes our nervous system more intense. It screws up our sleep more. It makes our mind more jumbled. So I go somewhere, I sit in the parks or I sit in the forest and um, there I would generally, uh, I read, uh, I find always, I, I always try to get specifically, I think that you're know, reading, um, not just, we have to find a wide variety of things, specifically many devotees. Uh, I find sometimes when I'm very challenged or when I'm very tired, it's difficult to read heavy philosophy. You know? Like then heavy philosophy is difficult. So then there are some nice books that devotees have written that are very uh, easy to read and very touching. Like now at this moment, I'm reading uh, Five Years and Eleven Months. I don't know if you've ever read that by Vishaka. So she's a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And she went, it's her biography of how she met Prabhupada and how she traveled to India and just how she transitioned to come to the path of Krishna consciousness from, uh, she was also a New Yorker, actually a very atheist kind of New York intellectual person and how she became a devotee. So at the moment, that book is providing me great solace because it's very easy to read. It's very nice. And when I get overwhelmed, I just put off my cell phone, jump out of the window so that no one sees where I'm going. And then I go sit in the park and then I can read. But the examples, so we all find our different ways. But the point is that we do have to take breaks sometimes because when we become overwhelmed, it means we need to now take a break to recharge. And you have to find good ways to recharge because if you're going to, if you're going to take your break in the wrong ways, then you just make it worse. So then when you escape and you come back, things don't look better. But, you know, when you go to the park, you sit there for an hour, you sit in the sun, you read something. Then when you come back to your life and you come back again to deal with the realities of, such a, of your situation, you feel better. You actually feel, yes, now I have some, I have some energy again. I'm recharged and I feel a bit more inspired. So that all of us, we have to create a nice culture for ourselves. Uh, and, and, and build enough positive things into our life that allow us to recharge in, in a good way. That's one example. And the other thing is um, really at the root of it, one has to start having great faith in the fact that Krishna is actually your friend. You know? um, that is very important. So now it's not just a practical thing about you know, trying to be a bit more in the mode of goodness or making these good decisions. Now it's really a question of the heart um, that one has to have this deep, one has to understand, even though sometimes we can feel alone or feel very overwhelmed, that at the root of it, actually Krishna is in control 
and that Krishna is really our friend. One has to have become firmly convinced of Krishna's benevolence um, because even in the face of great adversity or great challenges in life, um, we have to see behind it is Krishna. And, and he is actually concerned about our welfare. Um, and, and the same goes for the devotees. That sometimes even we can have, you know, the devotees, uh, the devotees, there are devotees in our lives that are actually very much concerned with wanting to see us happy. So by being able to connect with that, with that desire, connect with those people, if you can find those people that you know, they are actually interested in seeing me happy, interested in my welfare, and knowing that yes, behind them also is Krishna. That is a, is a great source of spiritual strength. And uh, it's kind of, if you look at, um, if you see the sannyasis, for example, it's explained that that is the whole purpose, traditionally, why people take sannyas, because they have to become fully fearless and understand that if I completely depend on Krishna, then he will protect me. Um, but all of us have to actually, it's not, it's not that just they have to do that. We also have to have that faith in, in our normal life that somehow or other Krishna will actually protect me. And um, that we have to somehow find it within ourselves uh, through prayer and through practice. And um, even sometimes if it's difficult to see it, um, that I've somehow also had to cultivate in the last bit. And that even in uh, times where it's difficult to see that, well, somehow Krishna has brought me here and he is my friend. So I'm sure that he will help me. Uh, if I try my best, I'm sure Krishna will help me. That is um, very simple, but it is actually very profound if we can connect to that kind of mood. But then we have to also you know, use our intelligence to make sure that we do our bit in uh, addressing the situation and uh, just seeing that in any situation, the reality is, is that there's always something you can do. Uh, you might not be able to completely change it and make it all perfect overnight. But there's always something one can do, even if it's just something very small. So by doing whatever it is that we can do, then um, we also start to, then we perform our responsibility and then Krishna will help us. Janitai, I know, is also a person who has this great faith in Krishna's friendship. And uh, he's also, whenever you're there in Berlin struggling, he can also help you to remember that Krishna is your friend. <laughs> Yes, he actually helped yeah, already a lot. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very, very much for his help. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, one question here from Diptanshu Prabhu. Mm. Thank you, Prabhu, so much. Uh, um, so uh, you mentioned lust, and lust itself perhaps is in the mode of ignorance and perhaps some other things like ang anger, frustrations. But it comes from the mode of passion. That's what Krishna says in 37. Can you please elaborate a little bit on this? Uh, so again, it says that what comes from the mode of passion, you mean lust and anger. Yeah. So the question is, how, how do these things come from passion? Yeah. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. The mode of passion is characterized by um, the root of it is just intense self-absorption. So intensely being absorbed within ourself, our own desires and uh, our own will in one sense. And uh, from that, we then tune in so much to what it is that we want and we start to ignore what is the bigger picture. So that is what passion does. It, we see that at the root of passion is that uh, you know, that strong desire that comes when we go for our own ambitions and our own personal desires in exclusion of thinking of the bigger picture. And then the moment that you do that, inevitably you will be frustrated. And then the moment that that frustration comes, then there will be anger. And that anger will then ruin the intelligence. So something we experience again and again. So then what is the alternative to passion? So that we see that if you want to move away from passion, so then it's interesting to see that the real, if, if lust and anger comes from passion, then we have to obviously move away from the passion. And what's the alternatives? The alternatives, you have two alternatives to the mode of passion. 
the one is the mode of ignorance. So therefore we see that many, many people, uh, especially people work very, very hard. So in many businesses, for example, or much of the world, uh, the way, how is it that they can get people to work so extremely hard, 10, 12 hours a day? How, is, how can they do that? Because they pay them so much money. You know? So you pay people enough. In New York City, you can see it. Here, people work, you cannot believe how hard people work. Uh, why do they work so hard? Because you can get so much money. Here, a doctor in New York City gets like almost $100,000 a month. This is amazing how much money people can make here. So, but then these people, what they also have to do, because you cannot always stay in passion, then you have to somehow, you, can take, you have to take some intoxication to chill out a little bit. So therefore people have to drink or smoke weed so that you can just calm down and relax a little bit and not be so hit so hard by desire. So that's the one option is you can go down into ignorance. The other option is that to get away from passion is you can go up into the mode of goodness. And going up into the mode of goodness means that uh, you think you try to start seeing the bigger picture. You start becoming more sensitive to other people, start becoming more considerate, thinking about how your influence, your actions are influencing other people around you, how it's influencing the planet, how it's influencing other species of life. And ultimately, when the moment that you start becoming sensitive to how it is influencing Krishna, well, then you become transcendental. But we can see why the mode of goodness really helps. So as we go into the mode of goodness, if you are able to be... Hi, Vilas. We cannot hear you at the moment. I'm sorry, I see it's cut off. So uh, when we become sensitive and considerate to other people's desires, then it also becomes more easy to be considerate about Krishna's desires, which then takes us into bhakti. So therefore, really it is by um, starting to become less selfish that we will move away from uh, anger and, and lust. And therefore we see Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he explained that uh, in this age, the only way in which we can be saved from the strong passion um, that is there within our environment and in our society is if we participate in spreading Krishna consciousness. Because somehow or other, by engaging in Sankirtan or trying our best to give Krishna consciousness to others, there we actually realize how nice it is when we are, are giving, making other people happy. And in that experience of giving some of our energy to give happiness to others, what happens is, is that we become relieved from a large amount of um, our own lust and our own personal desire. So uh, very simple, but, um, and we can all do that by sacrificing a little bit of energy for Krishna consciousness. It is, as Prabhupada says here, it is practically the most efficient way by which we can become relieved from our material conditioning. And uh, that is what will take us away from this mode of passion. So definitely simple for the simple, as they say, but not always necessarily easy. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I have another uh, question. Yes. Uh, it's rega regarding lust. And uh, you said this that uh, if we feed it, it will make uh, it the uh, lust, the desire will be more hungry. Yes. So what if one overdo the sense gratification so that one gets so fed up of it um, and then you renounce it? Will, will, mm. the desire, will the desire be gone or will you just kind of dull it for uh, a period of time? Interesting. There is a... It is sometimes prescribed as a strategy, but it's a very risky strategy uh, that you can flood the senses. Um, I think most of us have actually done it to a large part. At least I've tried my best before Krishna consciousness, almost killed myself in the process. And uh, luckily I survived. But um, it is a risky strategy. But we see that um, uh, you know, usually that's how it goes. Many people at least devotees, that's why devotees have a tendency to be quite intense individuals because they are, you know, they were intensely looking for happiness and they were sometimes, yeah, looking at her in all kinds of places. Um, but the moment that we come to Krishna consciousness, what happens is, is that there's another alternative that opens up for us, which is that we can take shelter 
of the variety of sensual experiences that are given to us even in Krishna consciousness. And that becomes then in one sense, that is our version of flooding the senses, one can say. For example, I mean, is there like, if you look at your average brahmachari, your temple brahmachari, where have you seen a human being that can eat that much uh, is astounding. Never, never in a normal society can people eat, eat, eat that amount of food. But we see that that's why Krishna consciousness, we can uh, then in one sense, um, by taking shelter of Krishna conscious sense objects, we can actually, in one sense then, uh, flood yeah like sort of preserve ourselves from doing something crazy like i have one friend who has a serious cocaine problem so what can you say he's a devotee also but somehow um, he, he had some he has some cocaine issues so sometimes he just has to eat a lot of butter and sugar you know that's just that's how it goes when the cravings get really rough he does the most amazing um, he creates the most amazing sweets. You've never seen something like that in your life, but it's still way better than taking cocaine. So in that way, we can also, um, by taking shelter of these Christian conscious experiences, other thing, for example, is that um, heavy dancing in kirtan is another example that we see that it has the ability to really engage so much physical energy. So therefore, once we get to Christian consciousness, we just have such a, we have a more powerful strategy in one sense to be able to, um, overcome uh, or flood the senses, one would say, flood them with certain experiences that will keep them engaged. But um, yeah, sometimes people, as we say, have to go for it. And uh, in the absence of any spiritual alternative, then what can we do? Then we see that I've met some people who also did that, you know, who have, um, you see people who have, especially drug addicts, or whatever, they may be, they really they went as deep as they can go in it. And then they, they come out of it with great realization. And uh, it does definitely happen, but it would be one would never be a strategy that one can recommend for people because it is risky. Most, the majority of people who try to flood the senses with the sense objects, they get destroyed. Uh, they, ruin, they ruin their life or they ruin their health or they ruin their mind. Um, uh, a, a portion of them come out the other side um, with deep realization. So therefore, it's not actually recommended in scripture, but it is. It is said that yes, sometimes it does actually work. Thank you so much. Um, I also saw that there's someone who wrote a question in the chat. Yes, I see this. Uh, can you see it? Or I can see it. Yeah. Um, second chapter, verse fifty-four. Arjuna is asking about the symptoms of a person who is merged in transcendence. The reply that Krishna gives in the verse 55 to 58 is a little hard to comprehend, especially when a devotee has to deal with the world. A devotee has to use anger, fear, attachment in the real world and for Krishna's service. It becomes difficult to understand about it. what is the position of a person, as Krishna is suggesting, to withdraw from such things, whereas for devotee. Are you both? Are you with us? Are you with us? We lost you again. Still cannot hear you, Harry Villas. So it's a Wie bitte? Gibt es eine Zeitbeschränkung? Ja, ich sage dann auch, das ist die letzte. Nee, ich frage von Zoom aus, nicht von uns. Oder? Ach so, nee. Also wir haben, ich glaube, also dann würde es ja halt total aufhören. Also würde die anderen sehen, dann sind wir ja noch. Und die ich glaube, jetzt ist er wieder ganz weg. Ah, <laughs> we see you, but you cannot hear you. Hi, 
both? Can you hear me now? Yes, now we hear you. Okay. So, Krishna says, attachment, fear, and anger, you have to abandon them. But then this devotee is asking that that doesn't make sense because if I abandon attachment, fear, and anger, No, you're very, uh, you're very good. Uh, there's a lot of other sounds, but your voice is very low. Let's see here. Um, is it now better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Okay. So, attachment, fear, and anger. We have to engage it in Krishna's service. That is the way, really. When Krishna says, whenever he says we have to abandon something, it means we have to abandon its material counterpart. Um, but at the same time, it means to engage it in Krishna's service. That's how we abandon it. So attachment, fear, and anger can all be connected in Krishna's service. So as we shift our attachment to things which are um, connected to Krishna, then immediately our material attachments dissipate. As we shift our attachment that is connected, or at anger that is um, anger that is connected to Krishna, um, then it becomes then we become relieved from the other form of anger. So in this way, um, we know that it's a basic part of our philosophy. But it's very deep and profound. And in terms of how to use that then in the material world, yes, yeah, sometimes in the material world, you have to use these things intelligently. See, these things are all they have their function. Like for example, when I came here to New York City. After a few weeks, my Guru Maharaj, he sat me down and then he told me, he said, Hari Vilas, you're too polite. You're not going to survive in this place. These people are all aggressive people that are very powerful. So you have to, you can't be so polite and you're not going to be able to get anything done. So it was quite a shift for me to be able to, to realize that, wow, now I have to sometimes get a little angry. Otherwise, nothing will happen, you know. Or sometimes when people do things that they're not supposed to do, you have to show a little anger. So, um, or you have to become, uh, if you ever get into management or if you ever get into a responsibility even for a project, then you have to become attached to it. You know, like if you become, if you run a temple, you have to become attached to that building. You have to be, if you see something dirty, it has to, it has to trouble you. It has to be a problem for you, you know? Otherwise, the thing is gonna stay unclean. So we see that it's practical, attachment, fear and anger. And they have to be connected to Krishna. So fear also. And we have to be afraid. Or sometimes we have to um, fear what would happen if I forget Krishna. Uh, that's also an intelligent fear. What would happen if I stop chanting my rounds? What would, how would my life look? Oh my God, if I think about it, I start to break out in a cold sweat. And I think, oof, I don't, want to, I don't want to know what happens. So we see that, yeah, fear and anger. And attachment they have to be practically engaged but with great caution that's the thing with great uh, caution and carefulness because these three things are very very powerful forces and uh, they can uh, cause great disruption when not properly channeled but at the same time they cannot disappear they will never be able to disappear in your life they all have their function and they have to be used in accordance with what is practically good for your own spiritual life and Krishna's desire. And uh, we see at the same time, fascinating how uh, King Yudhishthir uh, from the Mahabharat, one of his names was Ajata Shatru. So it means the man whose enemy has never been born because it explained that he had no enemies. But what is interesting is that he killed millions of people. <laughs> Isn't that so ironic? <laughs> because he fought the Mabharat war, and in that war, millions of people died. But then we see, but how is it that Yudhisthira is a Jhata Shatru? How can he have no enemies if he fought in a war? So we understand that in his heart, he bore no enmity to anyone. He bore no enmity to anyone. And he simply was discharging his duty as a king, however that, that duty took him. So that is the mystery, the, the fascinating mystery of Christian consciousness, uh, practical mysticism, as Prabhupada said, meaning that we, when we start performing things truly for the sake of Krishna, then we can always stay um, protected 
from attachment, fear, and anger in our personal sense. And we are simply executing whatever it is that Krishna is desiring. Uh, and in that way, whatever even then our material duties that we have to perform, even though sometimes it can be difficult, it does not change our heart. Um, even if you are here and you have to, if you, if you are a king, you have to punish someone, or if you are a teacher and you have to punish people, or if you are a policeman and you have to do this or that, you can even do all these things without creating enmity, with not seeing people as your enemies, but seeing it as simply you're executing your duty that has come your way. So this duty consciousness is very powerful and it protects us from the reactions of performing um, various things that are just required that we have to do um, um, in order to deal with the realities of material life. Can I see there's a few more questions here on the Yeah, chat. that's business with the side it's so yeah. Maybe you can do one more question. Uh, okay. Because time is um, time is running out. Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. It's not that we're not eager to listen more, but we no, no, no. do a few steps of the program here. No problem. I see this question is a personal question, so I can answer that. Um, I can answer that. There's a question of there's a booklet bridging the gap that I wrote. Where can you access it? You can find that booklet on Karamakanana Swami's website. Um, on his web store, um, there is uh, various things that we've done for Maharaj, and it's all available there. So you can download the PDF from, um, I think it's KKS Blog, I believe is the website, or KKS Media. We just have well, Maharaj's website where you can find the series and stuff. That booklet is also there. KKS okay. Blog, is it? Yeah. KKS Blog, that's it. Okay, Johnny Ties, that's it. <laughs> that was a question, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can take, I don't know, I can do whatever you want me to do. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know, there was... I think, I think that's it, it yeah. I, okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank Harry, you very much. much. I hope we will have... Hare Krishna, to... thank you so much, Prabhu. Oh, thank you, Maharaj. I hope we have the opportunity to have you again on Zoom one day. Or yes. to see you here in Berlin, to invite you to Berlin. That would be great. <laughs> or to be in it. New York or anywhere else. One day. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, devotees. It was very much nice to be with you all. And uh, apologies for all the technical difficulties. But at the end, we could speak about Krishna in any case. So, no problem. <laughs> so, we wish you all the best in your various services. It was and, a pleasure. <laughs> uh, to see you one day in Iskwan, Berlin. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.